All right, so our Buzzing with Bagworms program. Um, this one was a little bit interesting for me to go through because I needed a bit of a refresher. I have looked at this particular group of insects before. Um, it's just been quite a few years. Now, one thing about bagworms is that they are so prevalent throughout Indiana, especially the part of Indiana that I work in, that it is impossible to find a property that does not get infested with bagworms. Um, there are a lot of things I hear out there that talk about how to get rid of bagworms. Some of them are true, some of them are not. So what I want you guys to do for just a moment is kind of focus on this image. And this is just an excellent picture that we have here. If you look at it closely, you can actually see a little bit of the webbing that's stretching between the individual bags and other parts of the plant. So when we look at these things and we see the bags here, what we are looking at are actually cocoons. And these cocoons are the best way that these insects keep themselves safe as they consume the various parts of our junipers, our cedars, or our pine, or what have you. But a lot of folks don't realize what they actually are. Um, most folks just see the bags and they think there's some kind of gross worm in it and they try to pluck it off and get rid of it. Well, there's actually a little bit more to these insects. So what's really interesting about these insects is they are Lepidopterans. And what that is, for those of you who aren't aware, is that these are members of Lepidoptera, which means they are butterflies or moths. And in this case, they are a type of clear wing moth. Um, they are a part of a family called Psychidae, which I misspelled in the uh, frame right here. So they're kind of their own group unto themselves. And what's really, really interesting about them, and this is the reason why a lot of people don't know a lot about them, is because they have what's referred to as sexual dimorphism, which means that there is a significant difference between the males and females of this group of insects. And it pertains to the way the female develops as they mature. So why don't we go a little bit into their life cycle on this one. I'm gonna start with the egg portion of it. So for bagworms, what we see is that the eggs will hatch in May through mid-June. So the eggs are pretty freshly hatched right now and they are developing. This may also, hint, this makes it an ideal time to treat for them too. The larva, once they've hatched out, will spread from tree to tree using a method that we refer to as ballooning. What it really is, is the larva will spin some silk, a nice long thread of it, and let the wind catch it. And the larva are light enough that they'll just get carried along with the silk until they balloon into another tree not too far from where they started. This is actually a strategy that we see used with a lot of insects and a lot of spiders. So what they do is as soon as they land, they are gonna craft a bag as quickly as possible. That bag is their lifeline that protects them from uh, predators, it helps camouflage them, so they're very difficult to find, and it just gives them a lot of benefits, so that way they can go about doing their business. So what I'm showing you here is a close-up of the eggs inside of a bag. Now, I'm going to go into this a little bit further later, but what happens here is that the mother of these insects, when she, after she's mated, she will die and the eggs will be kind of housed in her body, in her mummified remains. And those eggs will be able to survive just fine throughout the winter until they eventually hatch out in May. So you can see here, they're covered in silk. They're surrounded by the material of the mother's bag as well as her own exoskeleton. So they're really, really well protected even as harsh as winters can get here in Indiana, they're going to survive it fairly easily so long as that bag stays intact. So as we go through the life cycle a little more, like I said, they're gonna craft that bag quickly using whatever plant matter and silk is available, and they're gonna keep building it up more and more as they grow. Eventually, that bag is going to reach a size of about one to two inches in the late summer. Unfortunately, this means that it coincides when, when we first notice them, because at first they're really, really tiny and we don't see them very well. For example, this is what it looks like after these guys are recently hatched. They're on individual pine needles in these images. They're not big at all, so they're really difficult for us to see, but the trouble is they're still doing damage during that time. By the time we notice them when they're one to two inches large, 
it's actually too late to try to treat for them and expect to save our trees. They've done the damage at that point. So this is going to be important when you begin having problems with bagworms. If you've had them years before, you're probably going to have them again this year. And if you want to get rid of them, you need to take action now. And I'm going to go into in a little bit what you can do to try to get rid of them. So this is just a great example of what this caterpillar looks like. And it is a caterpillar, just like with a tomato hornworm or anything else. And you could see it chewing away at this. I think that's a juniper needle right there. It's got a nice bag surrounding it. And you can even see it's kind of wrapped up in uh, some green juniper leaves and other material that it's just gotten and piece that bag together. Now, I want you to remember this image for a little bit here because it's going to come in, into play a little bit more when we start talking about adulthood with these insects. So what they're gonna do as they keep going, these larvae will move around the tree. They will be active and they will be moving. And what that previous image you saw is, I'll just go back to it for a moment. You could see that their three legs in front are poking out. They are moving around with that. So they're not just going to be hanging onto the tree. They will try to get to better spots to feed. As they get more developed, eventually what they'll do is they will permanently attach that bag to tree limbs or leaves with some silk. The larva is going to pupate inside of that bag, so it's going to be protected, and that's going to happen in a few weeks. Once they start pupating, after about four weeks, that larva will hatch out into its adult form. Now remember how I was talking about sexual dimorphism earlier. This is going to come into play in a moment here. Now inside the bag, if you cut one open while it's pupating, and keep that in mind, this is what you'll see. This isn't a dead larva, this is a cocoon. It just isn't very obfuscated except by the bag itself. It doesn't look like what you'd see with a tomato hornworm where the cocoon is completely kind of covered and you can't see it very well. It'll just look like a very still version of the caterpillar, but if you actually poked it or something, it might actually move or wiggle around a little bit to try to frighten you away. And then once hatching begins, we're going to see a few changes, and this is going to be based on the sex of the insect itself. So if it is a female, the female will lose all of her legs and she will never develop wings. So that picture of the larva up close that I showed you where it's feeding, that's what the female is essentially going to look like and just take the legs off of it. She's going to finish her life out inside of that bag. She won't feed and she won't move ever again. The males, however, will actually develop into a moth. It's going to become a clear wing moth, and I'm going to show you a picture of that in a moment. Now, neither sex is actually capable of feeding. They, their digestive tract will atrophy. They're going to survive off of whatever energy they were able to gather as larva, which is why they're consuming so much food while they're developing. The only purpose behind these insects is simply to mate. Once they mate, they're going to produce their eggs and then they're going to die. Now this is an example of a male uh, bagworm, a male psychidae moth. And you can see it's got very clear wings here. It has some hair on it, which is a little bit unique, but it has no scales on its wings. It does have the body form of a traditional moth. And you can even tell that it's male very easily if you're an entomologist, because if you look towards the back of its abdomen, that kind of clear, almost plasticky looking brown stuff you see at the end is actually a clasper it uses to attach onto a female for mating purposes. Um, it also has the body form where it has those antenna that are kind of filamentous. Um, it's just missing the scales on its wings, which is really what separates it from other moth species. Okay, so we talked about this insect's biology a little bit. So keep in mind, and I do want to go back for a moment, back to the image where I was showing you the eggs. So this is what the end result of that mating is actually going to be. And I apologize if this image is a little gross to you, but I do like to make sure that you're pretty well filled in on these things. That female, once she mates, she will die. Um, there's nothing that stops that. She won't survive. Her eggs have already developed inside of her body. And once they're fertilized, her work is done. Now, the larvae don't consume the mother, 
she just mummifies. She just provides protection. And after that protection is done, they get through the winter and the whole cycle starts over again. All right, so back to where we were. All right, so let's talk about some host plants and some damage here. Now, one thing that I want to add here is if you guys have questions about your arbor vitae or your juniper or other plants, any diseases or issues like with pine or anything, please feel free to ask them. Um, there is not much here in this presentation because there isn't a whole lot about bag rooms we can really dive into. So please, if you have other questions about these plants, just go ahead and throw them at me and I'll be happy to address them. Okay, so I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the damage from bagworms isn't readily noticed early on. And I showed you that picture of the really tiny bagworms, and that's why. Um, when they're small, the damage is pretty minuscule. You might think maybe there's a rust disease or maybe there's another plant disease going on because you may not notice the active insects. By the time the insect grows, the damage becomes noticeable. However, that also coincides with the worst time to try to do anything because as they get larger, the foliation is going to get more severe. And of course, the insects are going to be so large that treating for them becomes more difficult. And eventually, you get this as a result. Uh, this is an arborvitae and it is dying due to the effect of bagworms. That is how severely damaging they can be in an uncontrolled infestation. So if you're looking at this picture, you might go, well, some of my shrubs are doing that from the bottom up. You don't wanna mistake this because there are some disease and some environmental issues that may mimic this appearance. Like if there's a lack of water going to shrubs, they'll begin to die from the bottom up and it'll look a lot like this. However, I know this is a bagworm infestation because you can see it happening on a portion of this plant where the bagworms ballooned in and they found food there and they're just going to keep going. You could even see on the left plant, if you look where the two plants are meeting, you can see where damage is beginning to occur there as they travel over the entire uh, plant. And you can see, I know the picture is a little rough, but there are some bags in those trees if you look closely. So I'm gonna go through some of the host plants. This is not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of plants they can hit. However, this is a list of plants that I typically find them attacking the most. Uh, Arborvitae, I've spelled that, I apologize. Arborvitae in this image is one of their favored ones. And we do plant it fairly regularly as an ornamental on our properties. Um, I find this especially prevalent around farming communities because these make excellent windbreaks and some of them will have been planted a couple generations back and they'll, they'll remain in some state or another. Um, these make great nesting areas for bagworms because the plants offer just an absolute ton of protection. Lots of nooks and crannies for them to hide in and they can just chew away on these things. And if it's not even a bad infestation, they can keep the host alive for years and just keep using it as a host plant. Another example of a great host is going to be our cedar plants or uh, cedar trees, etc. These are very commonly attacked. Um, you can find these all over the place. Um, one thing to keep in mind though, is that cedar is also subject to a particular disease that people think can be caused by bagworms. So if you have ever had an encounter with cedar apple rust, that is not due to bagworms. Cedar apple rust gets caused because you're planting your cedar too close um, to either an infested arborvitae, which is already attacked by the disease, or an apple tree or hawthorn. You need to make sure that when you're choosing planting locations, spread these trees a good distance from each other, more than 50 feet, preferably like 150 to avoid that disease. The bagworms, however, have nothing to do with it. Juniper is perhaps one of the most attacked plants that I find with bagworms. And I think this image really illustrates that just absolutely wonderfully. Um, they are much like our arborvitae. They provide a lot of protection and they provide a huge amount of food. Uh, juniper will happily produce these big, long, intricate needles that spread everywhere. And they are just like a candy shop to a bagworm. They are terrific and they can get very large and it doesn't matter how high they are. A lot of our juniper bushes can stay very low to the ground, which means that they won't be attacked by birds as often. So they get a lot of protection in there. 
Um, I strongly advise any of you who are worried about bagworms right now to start doing some scouting work in all of these plants, particularly these junipers. And of course, our last one and our favorite one are our pine trees. Um, we have a lot of white pine that we like to plant and bagworms will readily attack white pine. But we also have another issue with our white pine plants due to white pine decline. Now, the reason I bring this up is because bagworms will often occur on pine trees, but they are not related to white pine decline. If you notice that your pine tree is beginning to die from the bottom up and that the bark takes on a shriveled appearance, that is due to decline. Now, the way to resolve that is to plant your pine trees in a different location. The, if they're starting to go through decline, that means they're just in a poor spot. The environment isn't good for them. They're not getting nutrients or they're getting too much water. Um, you're probably going to have to remove that tree and just replant a new one somewhere else. Bagworms will chew up all of the needles and eventually you'll see um, a certain amount of death happen in the tree, though I usually don't see infestation so bad that the pine is lost, but it can happen. I just don't see that very often at all. All right, so those are our four favored plants, and I've got them listed right here, Arbor Vitae, Juniper, Cedar, and Pine. Um, however, bagworms are not limited to those plants. There are several other that they can attack, and sometimes they can even be deciduous trees. Much like many of the other insects that I've talked about or uh, other types of organisms that I've talked about, what they're going to do is they're going to do what's called habitat selection they're going to choose the best habitat first, and then they're going to move to the next best one, and then the next best one after that, based on how full that habitat is. If they feel like they can't compete there, they're gonna to try to move on to find something better. Um, however, if they do move on to the things like a deciduous tree, they usually can't do very much damage to it. They aren't very good at it. They, they are evolved to be able to attack plants that are more in the evergreen family or conifers. All right, so one last thing that I wanted to do here was I wanted to add a little bit of information on things we often confuse our things with. Oh, I'm sorry, I about skipped ahead. I wanted to cover pest management first, so you guys will have to forgive me for that one. All right, a little bit of pest management on this. The good thing is there isn't a whole lot of information right here. It's actually fairly simple. Uh, the bad thing is, is that even though it's simple, doesn't mean that it's not a lot of work. So bagworms are easily handled by simply removing them directly from the tree. And the earlier you can get started, the better. What I would do is I would take a bucket of soapy water and just start picking bags off my trees and throw them in the bucket of soapy water to drown and kill the insects. Don't throw them back on the ground. If you do that, there's a possibility eggs inside of a female could survive and then they'll just hatch out and you'll get your problem back next season. Make sure you either put them in that bucket of soapy water or take them to a trash bag or throw them in a burn pile. Don't leave them there on the ground and get them off of the tree. The earlier you can get to work on this, the better. Because if you can remove those bags earlier, you're reducing the chances that you'll have mated females in your group. So you'll reduce the chances that eggs will be present. Um, and that will help reduce your pest load the further you get into the season and into the next season for that matter. Now there are some biological control opportunities you can do here. Um, Ichneumonid wasp, which I've shown in a few different programs and I would highly advise you guys if you're curious about them to look up some of our earlier gardening programs and I can always talk to you about them over email too. Um, they are biocontrol agents of bagworms. They're insects that will just naturally attack them. Um, what they will do is they will lay their eggs in the bagworms themselves and use them as a food source for their young. You can also use um, applications of a Bt pesticide. Now Bt is short for Bacillus thuringiensis and what this is is a bacteria that has a protein that will kill insects. Uh, the insect has to eat the bacteria to be able to ingest the protein. And when it does, the protein will destroy the insect's digestive tract. Um, you can actually purchase this stuff under labels such as Dipel or Thuricide. Now, the great thing about BT products is that they are actually fairly targeted. They really only work well with moths. 
They don't make a big impact on a lot of other insects at all. And the other great thing is that they can only impact insects. So if you somehow manage to ingest Bt, it will have no effect on you. You do not have the same bio, uh, biochemical machinery in your body and neither do your pets. Uh, so this stuff makes a great opportunity to control these insects. However, there is a problem with it. The insect has to ingest that bacteria, which means that if you spray it on a tree, the insect's going to have to digest some of that leaf tissue to be able to ingest the protein. So it's not a perfect solution, but it does offer one that's fairly low impact on non-target species and is fairly effective. Uh, one thing I will add to this though is um, I have some research experience in this area. The more you use BT products season after season, the more the uh, different pest populations are gonna become resistant to it. So if you do decide to employ this, you may want to rotate it in and out. So that way you're not worrying about them developing resistance. And I see we got a question in here and that's actually a really good question. Does BT affect honeybees? In order for that to happen, the honeybees would have to be consuming it. So the honeybees are going for nectar from flowers and pollen from the flowers. So it would mean that you would have to spray it and get it on those flowers. So if you have flowers that you are using as a source for um, honeybees to get their food, I would avoid spraying it, but I haven't seen any compelling research yet that says that that kind of pesticide has an impact on honeybee populations. Um, honestly, I would be very surprised if it actually did, even if they directly consumed it, because it is just kind of targeted and most insects have a kind of a resistance to it already. Um, but if you're concerned about it, just don't use that around areas where you want pollinators to be. But like I said, I haven't seen compelling evidence that it actually has an impact on them. If anything, honeybees are going to be more susceptible to different kinds of pesticides that are used in agricultural situations, or say if you decided to use uh, a weed killer on your property, which might have it and other pesticides mixed in with it. So just be careful. I wouldn't worry too much though. All right, so some chemical control here. Now this is for the hard stuff. This is for the actual pesticide application, the stuff that is meant to kill insects pretty indiscriminately. Now, there may be times where your infestations have been bad enough that you might wanna consider this. I personally would recommend this as a very last result, resort here. Um, I think using a BT product for a year will probably help you out significantly. And I feel like the mechanical control is probably a better opportunity. Um, there could be a lot of different pollinators that might move throughout your different plants that are infested with bagworms. Um, and there could be just other beneficial insects that you don't want to kill here. Um, there are a lot of different pesticides that are labeled for use with bagworms, uh, different ones that have like cyfluthrin and a few other different um, active ingredients. So if you're wanting to get these, honestly, just look for pesticides that are labeled for use on bagworms. There are several different kinds and uh, there is a list of them I can share with all of you if you want. Um, I'm just not sure that me, in my experience, I'd be hesitant to take this particular route. So if it's one you're considering, uh, just email me and we could talk about it or email your own extension educator if you don't live in my counties. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it though. All right, so the part that I meant to get to earlier, um, a lot of people confuse different insects for backworms, and I want to do a little myth dispelling right now. So there are two major insects that people often confuse for backworms. One of them is the Eastern Tent Caterpillar, which we do have in our area of Indiana. This is also a caterpillar. It is also a moth relative. And what these guys will do is they will consume leaves on deciduous trees. They stick to those kinds of trees. And what they're going to do is they're going to form a, a much larger tent structure that will contain a lot of different larvae. Um, and they'll form them on parts of trees that they will feel safe on. So inside of that tent, there are actually several larvae that have consumed food and now they're getting ready to pupate and they're all gonna do it inside of there. Um, and you can even see, if you look towards the bottom of the tent, you could see the collected frass from these insects, all their excrement from consuming food just gathering there. 
Uh, these are unfortunately really nasty. Uh, I hope you've never had the unfortunate experience of walking underneath one and having it break open. Uh, my wife was telling me a tale about uh, her own experience with that earlier today. Um, so, but un unfortunately, we just find these things absolutely disgusting. Um, here is a close up image of the larva th of this particular insect, the eastern tent caterpillar. So you could see it is a lot different from our bagworm. It's a wholly different kind of insect. And they will be much more mobile across the leaves of the trees, but they are going to stick primarily to deciduous trees. Let's see, I've already covered a little bit of this insect, talking about where they be, are safe, but I did want to make sure that we noted that they do tend to infest wild cherry, apple, and crab apple more than anything. But these guys also are kind of generalists. There's a fairly large laundry list of trees that they will infest. Now, in my experience in my area, I usually see them on wild cherry quite a bit. So especially around pastures, if there's cherry developing in woods there where there's kind of an edge where it come, becomes a new habitat, I'll find these things quite a bit. The other one that we find is the fall webworm. Now, our eastern tent caterpillar that I was just talking about, we are going to see them very, very soon. Our fall webworm, however, are aptly named. They won't start appearing until the end of our season, late summer. Uh, we'll start seeing those in August. Now, as opposed to the uh, tent caterpillar, the webworms are going to form their webs at the ends of the tree, at the ends of the branches, and you'll see them wrap leaves up in all of their silk. And they look just as nasty, I'm afraid. Um, these guys are going to be, like I said, more active towards the end of the summer season. They're not going to be aiming for like safe areas on branches. They like to wrap up those leaves and surround themselves with it to give them basically a, a food source and to give themselves kind of a safe highway to move around a tree and be defended. Because if you can imagine a bird trying to pick those off, it's going to have a real hard time because it's going to encounter that webbing and it's just not going to be able to get out of it very, very easily. So if you're ever curious if something is a bagworm or not, just check how it's protecting itself. If you see tons of webbing covering a tree, like in this image, that's gonna be a fall webworm. If it's a tight wrap of silk around like a node point on a branch, that's going to be an Eastern tent caterpillar. However, individual bags that contain single larva, those are your bagworms. Those are the ones that we've been talking about most of the evening. All right, guys, I have my contact information here. Please feel free to give me a call or send me an email anytime. I've also got links to our Purdue Ed store for publications on a variety of problems, as well as a link to our uh, Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab.